Sure, I am good at rambling. So how many folks, is this their first Vernal Pool workshop? Raise your hand. Oh my gosh, that's exciting. Well, thanks for making it out today. I want to thank Greg for having me here. Hopefully, uh, after my presentation, you won't leave, but we'll stay for the other presentations. Uh, but Vernal Pools are such a unique ecosystem here in Ohio. And macroinvertebrates are just as unique and exciting. And how many people have already taken a look over there through the microscopes? Oh, I got to speak into the mic. Okay. All right, I will try. I feel like I'm a death metal vocalist right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, all right, so, uh, this is right. Macroinvertebrates, so big. Why are they so big? Because they're macro. Uh, you can see them with the naked eye. That's why they're called macroinvertebrates. And I know what your next question is, and yes, there are microinvertebrates that you need uh, special lenses to see. So I'm going to move on. So what is a macroinvertebrate? I kind of already talked about that a little bit. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to see, but uh, they are recyclers of the vernal pool, the original recyclers. They are predators of the vernal pool. They are parasitic. They are lunch for a lot of different animals. Even, obviously, some macroinvertebrates are predators that eat, on, eat other macroinvertebrates. And uh, really, is there anything they can't do? They can swim, some can fly, uh, some crawl. They're not really slimy like frogs and salamanders, so I guess they don't have that going for them. But uh, I want to cover a couple vertical species of macroinvertebrates. Now, I know this is a macroinvertebrate type of crowd, and I don't want to offend anybody if, say, I don't cover, you know, copepods, or if I don't cover aquatic worms, or leeches, or things like that, so I have limited time, so I try to, thank you, I try to just focus on some of the, the, the big folks of the vernal pool world. So, I know you can't really read that, can you, but uh, it says, what is the most famous vernal pool macroinvertebrate of all time, or at least maybe the past 500 million years? Fairy shrimp, yes! Congratulations, you win an invisible bear. Um, now, some people say, hey, a fairy shrimp, isn't that sea monkeys? And I cringe every time I hear that because sea monkeys are, are saltwater. Fairy shrimp are freshwater, so they're kind of like cousins. So don't think of sea monkeys, please. So now that I have that, that mental image in your mind, don't think about it. Uh, it is the fairy shrimp. And this one here is a male. Uh, my arms aren't long enough to reach up there, but you can kind of see it's claspers. And with the claspers, it holds on to the female, and they, you know, do their fairy shrimp dance for several days. Uh, it has antenna. Uh, it also has eyes that are on stalks, as you can kind of see. How many pairs of legs do you think they have? Anybody, just throw out a number. Two? Not two. Keep going up. Well, very close. I love it. One pairs of legs. Yeah, and it's really cool because they use their the bottom when they when they get to the adult stage, they use the bottom uh, legs to really propel themselves and that kind of creates a current. They swim upside down by the way. And then uh, that kind of passes the food up to, to their mouth. Um, so they hold on to the, the, the female, or the female lets them hold on for a couple days, several days actually. And then copulation is actually only a matter of minutes, and then the male's out of there, and then the male dies. And, uh, but the female is still, uh, she's still around kicking. This is a close-up of uh, the, feet, or the male's uh, claspers, like over there on the left. And over there you can kind of see, they almost look like a walrus. Uh, that's what it kind of reminds me of when I take a look at it. And they are attracted to light. So when you go out at nighttime to a vernal pool, the easy way to find out if there's a fairy shrimp in a vernal pool, turn your flashlight on, kind of crouch down over the water, and just hold it there for a minute or two and they're drawn to the light. After you draw them to the light... Dave, you, you still need to project to the back I, I of the room. Project. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank bad, you. Bad acoustics here. Okay. So they're drawn to the light. They, uh, they're drawn to the light. So when you see them, you can scoop them up in like an observation tray. You can put them under a microscope, things like that, and put them back. So from the fairy ship's perspective, it's telling its fairy ship friends that there's this bright light that came down and I stared at it, and then I got sucked up, and then I was poked and prodded, and then I was put back. 
Uh, the only difference between a fairy shrimp saying that and a human is the fairy shrimp doesn't drink alcohol, it doesn't smell like alcohol. I know, you didn't expect this type of macro vertebrate humor this early in the morning, did you? Uh, so this is the female fairy shrimp. Her head is, uh, looks almost more like a hammerhead shark. Her eyes are on the side as well. And she has a bird pouch, which I know you can't... I don't know if I... Oh, there we go. So that's like right there is the bird pouch. That's where the eggs develop. And actually, they're called cysts. And they're more developed than eggs, but I'm going to use the term eggs just to keep it simple. Uh, so the eggs will stay in there for... Is the pointer work? Oh, good, the pointer works. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So this is a, a picture of a female, and she has a bunch of cysts or eggs in the pouch, and she's going to carry those for, I think, it's several days as well. They will uh, hatch, or actually, I'm sorry, they don't hatch, they're released, and they fall down to the vertical pool substrate or the ground, and they'll remain there. They actually have a uh, summer egg, which has a, a thin coating, and then they also do a winter egg, which is a bit thicker coating. The reason why is the summer egg hatches sooner, kind of that, that season, where the winter egg overwinters uh, until the, uh, man, it's like the spirits don't want to be talking about fairy shrimp today. Um, the winter egg will last uh, for decades, actually. And given the right conditions, only about 3% uh, of the vernal pool eggs that are in the substrate will, will emerge given uh, any year. It's kind of like an evolutionary technique, so if we get a warm spell and they all jump out, like, hey, we're here, and then we get a cold spell and all the water freezes and then they all die and there's no more fairy shrimp in that, that rural pool. So it kind of protects them against that. This is, uh, this is a baby fairy shrimp. And I told you it's haunted. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, and I know it's not the technical term, baby fairy shrimp, but I just use it anyway. It's uh, not least. And this is one of the, the, what they kind of look like when they first emerge. So this one is really young. And uh, this one's a little bit older, this one's a little bit older, you can see all the legs. When they're this little, they actually use their antenna and kind of like their arms appear to propel themselves through the water until their legs fully develop. Uh, this is the, the microscope, like when I'm out in the field, I just use a microscope like this. Uh, it doesn't require electricity and uh, it has a five time lens on it. And you can actually get uh, kind, of decent, kind of decent pictures with your cell phone. So like this here is taken um, with the cell phone looking through, the, looking through that. I do have uh, some video. So this is, uh, I believe it's looking through the microscope. So that's kind of the uh, a fairy shrimp looking through the, the microscope. This is the adult fairy shrimp. And I still haven't figured out what the fairy shrimp's call is. So. so they kind of appear, they're called fairy shrimp, one reason is they look like shrimp. And then the other the fairy part is because they kind of emerge out of nowhere. Even if you have an ice covered vernal pool, they could be motoring around and swimming around underneath that so long as there's water. And this is a, a female fairy shrimp. And I think this one I have a female, and then later on is the male. And the male one I kind of slowed down so you can kind of see uh, how slow uh, or how fast flies go. And this is looking at it through, um, on a plastic spoon. It's going to slow down here in a minute. So it's very mesmerizing to be out there and kind of see that going on. It's just really cool. The fairy shrimp were put back in the vernal pool. No fairy shrimp were hurt in the making of this video. <laughs> Except these guys are predators of fairy shrimp. So waterfowl, they will, they will uh, eat up fairy shrimp. The fairy shrimp eggs uh, can actually survive being uh, ingested and digested uh, by a waterfowl. And it's uh, one way that they can uh, possibly propagate other vernal pools because, you know, the waterfowl do their business and then the fairy shrimp are in a new pool. 
Okay, so this is kind of all of the information that I just talked about on here. So I could have these, if you all want the presentation later on, I could send it to OWA to post or to hand out to folks. But uh, there are a couple species of fairy shrimp uh, in Ohio that I know of. That doesn't mean there's, there's, there's probably more. Um, and I always mispronounce the Latin names, even though I took, I think, two years of Latin way back in high school. But uh, I always have to kind of look at my shirt. Ebrancipus brunalis. So that's one species. There's also Neglectus. And that one uh, could survive in a little bit more uh, impacted area, although most fairy most shrimp are pretty sensitive to uh, pollution. So that's a little bit about fairy shrimp. Can anybody guess what the next macroinvertebrate uh, is going to be? Anybody just throw out, it, throw, out it, throw out some names. Dragonfly, not dragonfly. Not stonefly, you're getting closer. No, no. No, no. Let me give you a hint. No. <laughs> no, no, not that phantom. It's the phantom midge. Yeah, we actually have uh, have some over there. Good luck trying to find it, though, because as you can see, it's, they're also called glass worms, and uh, they're very translucent. And they're very tiny. They almost look like mosquito larvae when you're out in the vernal pool. Um, I was out in a pool with Ray about a month ago, and we kept seeing what we felt were mosquito larvae, and I was like, I'm just going to put it under the microscope and uh, take a look. And it turns out it was phantom midgets. So uh, they uh, have ballast. I need a, a third arm here. So they have these uh, air, air pockets right here, kind of two up front, two in the back, and they use that to move up and down in the water column. So at nighttime, they emerge, or they, they uh, go up into the water column because there's not as many predators that eat them, and then during the day, they go back down. Um, they move, they're kind of, they remind me of a, like a spaz of the vernal pool world because of the way they move is they basically like do that. Well, we'll see that here in a minute. Um, they are uh, ferocious predators. I mean, you wouldn't think it, right? Uh, I used to say that if we were the size of a lot of these macro vertebrates, a vernal pool would be a terrorizing place to live because there's all sorts of things that could take you out. Uh, these could be, if you're a mosquito larvae, this is your worst nightmare. Their um, uh, antenna have, uh, over the years, over evolution, have uh, actually formed to be more uh, graspers. And so uh, this is what the, oh, it does work, right? The little clicker. Awesome. So you can see right here, these are the, the, the antenna that are formed. So they'll hold on to it like a mosquito larvae. And then they have a, a tiny, I think they have a tiny beak somewhere. I can't see it in this picture, but they'll uh, pierce that mosquito larvae or their prey. They'll uh, put out like some enzymes that kind of loosen up the innards of the prey and then they suck it back out. So again, it's a horrifying place if you're, you know, a mosquito larvae or something along those lines. Uh, they do emerge as adults. Um, and I believe they emerge almost uh, over the course of a couple of days. So you can be out in the vernal pool and see a lot of these things emerge in, in uh, mid to late summer. And again, it's just one of the really cool things. We've all heard about the salamander migrations. In a sense, this is like another type of transformation or, or migration too. Uh, they do have four instar stages uh, before adulthood. Um, and, I, and there's actually, I think there's, there's 15 species in North America. You know, I, I, I can't remember if I said this at the beginning, but I, I consider myself a vernal pool enthusiast, not really an expert. Uh, so if you ask me, Dave, what type of kind of midge species is this? I will tell you, I don't know. Um, it, uh, I have no problem doing that because I'm not the, the foremost expert on them. They also eat uh, zooplankton. Um, and let's see what they look like. Now, this is going to be hard to see because they're transparent. But it's right here. This is like the head part, I think, and this is the back side. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to move. And I, I think I did this one in slow motion so you can kind of see. Okay, wait for it, wait for it. It's gonna do it, it's gonna do it. Here it is, see it? So it kind of like just throws itself and then goes back. And then there's a, a, the second part of this video will be in real time and there's gonna be a whole bunch of them. This one's kind of hard to see. Just ignore those keepers. This is a macro talk, not an amphibian talk. 
Um, I know it's hard to see, but all these little things right here, those are phantom midgets. And so it was really cool. It was just like the more I shine the light in, it's like the more I drew them to there. And I'm sure it's probably because I'm drawing some of their prey to the light, and they're following the prey. This is a, a close-up of a phantom midget. And this, again, this is looking through uh, the microscope and using my cell phone. Uh, one thing I learned, like with the cell phone, you put the camera setting on, you kind of zoom in a little bit before you put it over the, the lens of the microscope and you can get pretty good, pretty good pictures. And this is, this is slowed down. You see the kind of little, little hairs or filaments on the side too. So just a, kind of a fascinating creature. This is, a, again, a plastic spoon. Um, when you start doing vertical pull stuff, you just realize there's like really weird things that you wouldn't think of. So like a, a white plastic spoon, you can actually get really good pictures because of the white background. Um, this is a mosquito larvae right here. And then this is a phantom midge right here. So they look very similar. Uh, you can kind of tell the difference that we hear. The phantom midge has a little bit bigger, and it's probably plated. Um, area here, and then uh, the mosquito larvae, I don't know, they, they move differently too. Mosquito larvae have two different uh, um, forms in the water. They start off like this, and then they end up turning into a tumbler phase, which kind of looks like a comma that tumbles through the water, and then, that's when, and then they emerge from that. So this is information about the phantom midge. Um, this is about the caddisfly larvae that how many people have seen the caddisfly larvae over there? Awesome, they're, they're really exciting and they're, they're pretty sensitive species. So if you have caddisfly larvae, um, chances are you have a decent quality or a high quality vernal pool. I've been out at a pool where I've actually broken through the ice, did some sampling and got some caddisfly larvae that were like this large. So they're kind of out there uh, a good bit of the time. There are like, I think there's like 1,300 species of caddisfly larvae in North America. Um, there's only, I think, uh, about three, three families that really use vernal pools. Don't ask me which they are, because I'm not sure, but it is. You have your guidebook with you? Yeah, it looks like most people have a guide. So in the guidebook, it, it talks about all these things. It has the, the different individual species uh, name. Something that's cool about the caddisfly larvae is that, you know, they're, they're, so, they're so small, but, you know, they, they they're detrivores, they're herbivores, so when they're eating the vegetation, they're kind of sloppy eaters. And so while they're nibbling, pieces, you know, kind of float away. Well, those pieces, um, you know, have moss or algae, actually algae that form on them, and that provides food for other animals. And also the tiny, you know, the tiny pieces of leaf litter that, they're, that escape their, their mouth, other animals will eat that. So they are kind of a, a recycler to help other species in the vernal pool. Um, you know, this is, I think this is called, oops, oops. Um, I think this one's called the cigar shape, and it looks like a sh cigar. I know it's kind of hard to see up there. But um, they actually um, could create a water current or a current in their um, case because they do breathe oxygen, so they could do, they could remain in their case, move their legs, create a current, and then that helps them uh, with the oxygen intake. They do have uh, larval stages. Uh, I think it usually lasts up to about three months uh, or, or possibly longer. And they have about up to seven uh, different molts that they do. Uh, again, it's, when you say caddisfly larvae, when you say fairy shrimp, when you say daphnia, there's a lot of species under each of those categories. And this is, uh, this is another type. Uh, again, I know it's hard to see. This one has uh, leaves that are more stacked versus rolled. You have this one, which uses like maybe tiny pieces of sediment. Here's another view of, of that one. Um, and then we'll see, we'll see some here in action. This is, again, another type. This one's using more uh, twig-like material. <coughs> uh, see this. I know this is gonna be really hard to see. I'll try to point it out. Oops. And this is the caddisfly larvae right here. As you can see, it is crawling about on some salamander egg masses. Now some of the, the caddisfly larvae do eat salamander eggs. I'm not sure if it's the embryo or the gel around them. But here you're going to see this guy scamper off in a minute. 
and we're going to see another type of caddis fly. So here's this one goes. Now this other one uh, is builds a massive home, and you can see it right there. It's kind of the job of the hut of the caddis fly world. The thing just kind of lumbers along. So what is one of the most numerous and early risers in the vernal pool season? Let's give you a hint. It's not, not Daphne. No, it is actually Daphnea, much more huggable and much more adorable in the vernal pool world. So as you can see, its antenna kind of stick up from its uh, carapace uh, along with its little tiny head. And uh, that's how it propels through the waters through using those antenna. And that kind of creates a current where um, it feeds on zooplankton, so it kind of pushes that through the carapace, and that's how it eats. It also feeds on algae and detritus as, as well. They do have compound eyes. Uh, you can't tell here, but they're actually really tiny. They're only up to about 0.5 centimeters in length. And uh, as you can see, the carapace covers most of the body. So they do have legs and antenna, and uh, they have a kind of like a move, stop, move type motion. And we'll see that here in a second. Come in peach, green, uh, and reddish in color. Reddish in color, that is. And that just depends on what they're feeding on. I've been to vernal pools where some of them are on one side of the pool, they're more peach color. And on the other side, they're more green color. Uh, speaking of the vernal pool, you know, when the ice is out there during the uh, winter months, it kind of provides uh, almost a safe haven for these guys as well as the fairy shrimp. And they could really explode their numbers at that point. And then when the ice melts, you get a lot of the other predators that come out and eat them because anything that's a predator in a vernal pool most likely feeds on Daphnia. Um, so this is another view. You could see this. Uh, both uh, Daphnia have eggs uh, and uh it's interesting because they uh, will hatch and they'll hang out inside the Daphnia and then a couple of days later they're released into the into the wild if you will into the water and they look like miniature versions of the adults so here's another uh, picture of a Daphnia um, and uh, I, uh, they're also known as water fleas so they again they but they're not uh, like the fleas that make you itch or anything like that and sometimes believe it or not they can alter their shape depending on the predation pressure in the vernal pool so they can kind of develop uh, sharp spines at the end of the body as well as almost like a helmet type thing and I do have a picture of uh, a helmet on one of them here let's go ahead and bring that in there there it is so obviously this helmet is not going to do much good uh, for this Daphnia but sometimes uh, maybe some of the other helmets will uh, this is a, a yeah, to show you how small this is a spoon and uh, that little droplet of water and you can see the Daphnia in there so they're incredibly tiny once you get used to kind of seeing what they look like uh, they're pretty easy to identify uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what a Daphnia looks like in motion. So as you can see, it's pretty, pretty cool, pretty fascinating. This is out at a vernal pool, and look how many Daphnia there are. Now, hopefully this doesn't freak you out because they're totally harmless to people, and they're actually really good for the environment, but you could have millions of them uh, swimming around in a vernal pool at, at any given time. Uh, although when the predators come out, uh, their numbers will shrink drastically. Uh, so it is one of those things where it's a predator-prey type relationship. So this is kind of what I mentioned here, uh, again, so you can kind of see all that. Now, I only covered some uh, macroinvertebrates. Uh, there are a ton of other macroinvertebrates that are out there. The, even this isn't all of them, but this kind of gives you an idea. of If you're out at a vernal pool, chances are you'll see uh, at least some of these, if not all of these, in a healthy vernal pool. So I do want to thank you for listening. And uh, that's me. And if you want to contact me, that's where you can contact me at. And uh, check out my website, vernalpoolguy.org. That's where I... Um, post my vernal pool expeditions and uh, adventures.